I want to start by thanking you very much for inviting me to speak to you today, and particularly Louisa Campbell and Stephen Greep for the invitation. Um, I head up the Archaeology and World Heritage Team at Historic Environment Scotland, and that includes the management of the Antonine Wall World Heritage property, and that's something I'll be speaking about a bit today. So when you do hear me refer to the wall, it's the Antonine Wall to which I'm referring. Um, I'll also say thank you for inviting me because those who do know me will know that I'm not a fine specialist. My specialist area of research is actually on Roman camps, which from a Roman finds perspective is probably the least interesting structures, although recent developer led excavations are now starting to provide some tantalising evidence and snippets and pieces of artefactual information. But that's not what I'm going to be talking about today. I thought I'd start with a reminder of where we're supposed to be meeting. So welcome to virtual Glasgow. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a background to Roman Scotland, particularly its chronology. Um, some artefactual highlights, certainly what I feel are some artefactual highlights from Roman Scotland and particularly from the Antonine Wall. And then also what we're doing to try and use archaeology to make a difference. Um, in Historic Environment Scotland, our corporate plan has an aim, which is to use our heritage to make a difference to society. And then we also have an archaeology strategy in Scotland, which is about making archaeology matter. And I hope you'll see some of the impact of various projects around Roman Scotland, but particularly the Antonine Wall with this talk today. I wanted to start by really emphasising that when it comes to Northern Britain, there has really quite understandably been a dominance of Hadrian's Wall in Roman North British studies. This is perhaps unsurprising given its magnificent presence and the way it dominates much of the landscape through which it runs. Also the wonderful selection of sites that you can visit with on-site museums which also enable you to see many of the artifacts at the sites where they were found. This is not something we have a plethora of in Scotland. And in many ways, the jewel in the crown when it comes to these rich artefacts is at Vindolanda, about which you'll hear more tomorrow, um, especially its fabulous museum. When we talk about Roman Scotland, actually what we're talking about are some brief defined interludes into an Iron Age society, into an Iron Age occupation of the landscape. And it's difficult to find an easy Iron Age map, but I hope you'll appreciate the one on the left here from History Scotland magazine, which is showing some of the tribal groupings. And on the right has been taken from the Iron Age report of the Scottish Archaeological Research Framework and highlights some of the key sites there. So really, this is about emphasising that this is an Iron Age landscape to which we have military occupation. When we start to look at site distribution, it's really quite defined. This particular image here is purely camps, but actually given that we have over 260 of them, it gives you an idea of where the Romans got to. Plus, in addition, we know that the fleet sailed around Britain in the first century. A distribution of artefacts would look a little different, but this at least is showing you where we have concrete evidence for the Roman army. So we have our first contact in the first century AD in the late 60s, early 70s in the Flavian period. And on the left, you have a distribution map of known Flavian forts and on the right, known Flavian camps. I'll emphasize, obviously, there are quite a number of camps for which we don't know the date. Now, our narrative has really been dominated by the biography of Agricola by his son-in-law Tacitus and the undiscovered Battle of Mons Graupius in AD 83. And although archaeology is showing that the picture is somewhat more complex, this at least gives you a geographic distribution of the, our current state of knowledge of the positioning of the Roman army in the first century. The latter part of the first century, due to troops being needed elsewhere, we have a withdrawal. And Tacitus bitterly comments in one of his publications that Britain was conquered and immediately thrown away. And there is a gradual retreat, as you see here in the later part of the first century, and then a movement down to the Stainegate line, which obviously later then became the Hadrian's Wall line. In the second century, after the death of Hadrian, 
and Antoninus Pius becoming emperor. We have the Antonine advance after, and we have the governor Lollius Urbicus sent north to build a wall and the Scriptoris Historia Augustus refers to him building a wall this time of turf. Now that is the Antonine Wall and here in this image here we have an aerial view of one of the more spectacular stretches at Rough Castle where the very impressive turf rampart and ditch can be clearly seen next to one of the more spectacular um, earth and timber forts. And in the early third century, we have the campaigns of the Emperor Septimius Severus and his sons before Septimius's death in York in February 211. And his sons abandoned the total conquest of the island and one killing the other and going for the glamour of Rome instead. And after that, we have the pulling back to the Hadrian's Wall line with its outpost forts. And although we have tantalising hints in the literature of campaigns north, presumably into Scotland at various points and times, and we have artifactual uh, material and hordes and things, but actually trying to put this into concrete archaeological evidence after the Severan period is particularly tricky. So in essence, we've got three main phases of, of incursion occupation of Scotland. We have the Flavian period in the first century, Antonine in the second, and Severan in the third. Now, in terms of what this has left us, it has left us a very rich military legacy. And here, I hope you can see um, quite clearly in the centre of the photograph, you can see the crop marks and indeed to a certain extent earthworks in places of the fortress, the legionary fortress at Inch Toothill. It's a long way north. It's also one of the very few fortresses in the whole Roman Empire which doesn't have a modern day settlement sitting on top of it. So you can actually stand on one side and see across to the other. So you really do get a sense of, of scale of this feature. But alongside crop marks, we've also got a landscape littered with other remains. Now, obviously, most of these are in, in earth and timber, but we do have some impressive stone, stone structures in pockets. Top left here, we have the really very spectacular fort of Ardoch in Perthshire. On the right, we have one of the fortlets at Durisdeer down in the Dumfriesia with its spectacular command of the landscape. And then in the bottom left, we have the bathhouse of the fort at Beer's Den. And you should already have heard from David Breeze earlier today about pottery from the fort there. We're also extremely fortunate that we've had a long history of research on Roman sites in Scotland. Particularly in the late 19th and early 20th century, there were twin programmes of, of research that really complemented each other by the Glasgow Archaeological Society on the Antonine Wall to prove that it was a turf wall. And then also by the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland on various forts. Um, we've got Rough Castle and Ardoch shown here, really giving us a fantastic base of evidence. Indeed, at those excavations at Rough Castle, this particular stone was found in 1903 and it shows that this was the Principia, the headquarters building. And up until this point, archaeologists around the Roman Empire had actually been referring to headquarters buildings as the Praetorium, which we now know as the commanding officer's house. So that really does emphasise the major international significance of this site and this find. So I thought I'd move on now to talking about some of the spectacular artefacts from Roman Scotland and indeed from the wall. Now, obviously we have, as you would expect, really quite a wonderful wealth of military remains. Um, many of the ones here from Newstead and I believe Mike Bishop has probably spoken about some of these today, the Fort of Trimontium. And also that there is a new museum at Trimontium in development, which will be to Roman and Iron Age Scotland, which no doubt will be an incredibly exciting museum to visit once it's complete and open. And alongside all this fabulous military equipment, we've got a wider range of material culture, which tell us about the daily lives of the soldiers and the military communities that surrounded them. We've got everything from funerary monuments um, through to religion and altars. We've got 
aspects of eating and drinking, metal, pottery, stone and glass. Beyond the forts themselves and beyond Roman context, we've got a range of other material culture. We've got hoards indicating bribery. And I know that we'll be hearing from Kathleen Clifford on the Vicus at Castle Dykes and also Tatiana Rivleva on glass bangles. And there's also some really exciting new research going on. I know we're not hearing about it this time, but I'm sure at past and future Roma Finds groups, you'll be hearing from John Reed and the work of the Tremontium Trust on the assemblage at Burns Walk and the new research they've been carrying sites there to help us find out a bit more about the context and the massive array of material that's come from there. And that's another one of the exciting sites that is starting to change the narrative and, and make us question existing assumptions about the Roman military in Scotland. So in terms of thinking about what are the highlights, well, anything that actually takes us into humanising things really is at a point when we're trying to interpret and make our archaeology matter that's about putting the personal putting the human back in and shoes are a wonderful way of, of doing that these examples here have all come from the Antonine Wall but obviously I know there are other sites notably Vindolanda and elsewhere that have also given us a wealth of evidence and I also wanted to highlight this oil lamp from the Roma Fort of Balmuldi a couple of years ago, colleagues and I were involved in a commemoration event 450 years since the Battle of Langside in Glasgow, which was a defeat of Mary, Queen of Scots. And we were asked if we would bring some educational resources because there's quite a, a big community there. And over the course of the weekend, we had 10,000 people through the, through the park looking at various things. So it was a very full on and exciting weekend of events. This particular lamp was picked up by one of the visitors to our tent and she then started asking me how it was used. And when I was started explaining, she immediately went, oh, yes, I know what this is. And then proceeded to tell me what it was called in Urdu, and which I wish now that I'd written down, and then told me how her grandparents had had something similar and how they'd used it. So it's fascinating the way that we can use these objects to connect with people. Now, obviously, we've got um, some wonderful evidence on the Antonine Wall and elsewhere about traders and civilians on frontiers. On the left here, we have a gravestone which was erected to Salmanes, a 15 year old boy, by his father, who was also called Salmanes. Now, the name is suggestive of a Middle Eastern origin for both. And as no rank is given for Salmanes Senior, it's possible that he was a trader or merchant. And this wasn't found far from the fort at Bar Hill, where we know that there was a regiment based there um, who had been raised in Syria. And on the right here, we have a Samian ware bowl from Balmuldi, which carries a maker's mark, Sinem, indicating that it came from a pottery workshop in Lezou in modern day France. And colleagues who are working on the rediscovering the Antonine Wall project, which I'll come on to shortly, are now making connections with the Roman Pottery Museum in Lisieux. Another aspect of the military community is the presence of women and children, an area which has seen increased research and awareness in recent years. This here is a tombstone to Vericunda, and it's been used to, by the Hunterian Museum and others to create a narrative of a slave girl called Varicunda, which is then used in interpretation to attempt to bring the museum collections to life for younger audiences. Another wonderful example we have here is Vibia Peccata, who's the wife of Flavius Vericundus, centurion of the 6th Legion Victrix at Westerwood Fort. Now she's one of the few women who left a trace by the dedication of this altar tone stone to Silvanus and the goddess of the crossroads. Now they're the only married couple that we definitively know of on the wall and legal and army documents allow us to consider her travels through the Roman Empire. And it's suggested from this dedication that they probably traveled from Pannonia, so modern day Austria and Hungary, possibly even via Northern Africa. And here we have a fantastic window pane with glass from Bar Hill, which have allowed for really some quite um, imaginative reconstructions and also use. 
And here you can see it's been put into the structure around a mobile phone, a tablet, which is used in interpretation work on the Antonine Wall. This brings me to the rather wonderful emotive project, which had colleagues from Glasgow University and the Hunterian Museum as part of a broader consortium, which received European Union Horizon 2020 funding. And this particular project was looking at emotional responses and different ways of using storytelling. Now in the Hunterian, which we were supposed to be visiting during this conference has a wealth of evidence from the Antonine Wall and this was what was used as the case study for the colleagues from Glasgow in their storytelling and creating interactive stories that require the user to engage to help determine where the story goes next. One such story that they developed was around the soldier Ibutius who scratched his name on the bronze hammer seen here which was found at Bar Hill. Now the visitor to the museum can use this and other objects to find out more about the life of Ibutius and answers questions about what decisions he may have taken at various points, which then lead to different scenarios, taking the visitor on the journey and making it interactive, which of course is a kind of process that young people involved in gaming are very familiar with today. Now, one of the themes obviously that, that comes through that's of interest is food and food and drink. And we've developed a suite of teaching packs for the Antonine Wall, which can be borrowed either from Historic Environment Scotland in Edinburgh or the Glasgow Museum's Resource Centre in Glasgow. Although I will say we've had interest in them from um, parts of Scotland way beyond uh, areas that were occupied by the Romans. We've created four of these uh, handling boxes with educational resources, teachings notes to go alongside them. We have a legionary soldier, a Syrian archer, an off-duty theme and food and cooking. And here is an example here from the Syrian archer box. Because we have a regiment of archer, archers which were raised in Syria, stationed at Bar Hill on the wall, we've used this to develop this pack so that we can use it in a range of settings. And one of the benefits of material like this is that these are about emphasising connections and what we have in common with people from around different parts of the Roman Empire. Now, lots of the resources that we've developed are either online or, you know, or, or have been online and now promoted more together online. So at the start of the lockdown in April at Historic Environment Scotland, we brought all our heritage learning resources together, including our Antonine Wall learning material knowing that thousands of parents across Scotland and indeed across the world were having to home educate their children this year. And we've got a range of cut out and make Roman helmet, Celtic armlets alongside a whole host of other activities, um, including colouring in. And we're intending to add to this as more online resources are developed. Now, although children in Scotland have returned to school, We've all got to be prepared for blended learning models and local lockdowns and school closures. Now, you may have noticed that many of the objects that I've been showing here were actually digitally captured and can be browsed, rotated and played with for free on Sketchfab. So if you go onto the Sketchfab website and look for Antonine Wall, which is part of the Historic Environment Scotland collection there, you'll see a wonderful array of resources that you can have a play around with. We have relatively recently finished a project which was about creating and enhancing content for our digital app for the wall. And if you haven't already downloaded it and you have a smartphone, I would encourage you to do so. And thanks to funding from Creative Europe and with our partners in Germany and Austria, we've been bringing site and artifactual material together through a range of different types of digital interpretation, including reconstructions and augmented reality. You can stand on a site, and find out about the artifacts discovered there, or stand in a museum and find out about the sites that the material came from, or you can sit at home and browse from there. And we've also created an interactive game called Go Roman, which is a quest style game. All of this can be freely downloaded from the uh, Apple App Store or Google Play. Since 2018, we've been running a project called Rediscovering the Antonine Wall, which has over £2 million with funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, LIDA, 
several landfill tax sources and from partner funds, which is Historic Environment Scotland and the five local authorities along the wall. Now, the project grew out of a desire to actively engage the communities living along the wall to improve awareness and relevance of the monument. So we asked the local communities what they wanted to see. And after an extensive consultation process, these local communities helped to co-design a series of local initiatives. And here, which is one of the recent ones, a horse harness loop from Keneal has been turned into a beautiful sculpture, which was chosen by the community and created by the artist Phil Neal. And that's only been in position for just over a month. Quite a number of the projects do involve regeneration work, whether regenerating forgotten areas through sculpture, Roman inspired art and replica distant stones, and through the development and redevelopment of play parks. We've got five play parks in development. One is already open and another will be open very soon. These play parks have all been co-designed with local children and feature stories about the diverse military population that lived in the area when the wall was occupied. This is all about learning through play and helping children to appreciate the local Roman heritage of where they live. Some of the projects that we're doing are activity based and although obviously we've had to pause a lot of them this year due to COVID, we hope to restart them again once it is safe to do so. One project is to work with asylum seekers and refugees who've relocated to Scotland and better understand their stories in relation to the wall, weaving them into the wider story. We know that the Romans moved soldiers around and that we have traders and families who came from around the empire. So this is a chance to explore stories and experiences from contemporary communities as well. Other projects include the trishaws that you see here, piloted by volunteers under the Cycling Without Age scheme. We're encouraging residents in local care homes and sheltered housing who may not otherwise be able to get out and about to have the chance to socialise and visit local heritage sites. These are intended to ease isolation, encourage socialising and provide a boost to mental health by visiting sites which they may otherwise find difficult to visit. One care home resident left his care home for the first time in a year on one of our trishaws. And here's another one that's designed to appeal to younger people. A local graffiti company will bring international artists to engage them and create Roman inspired graffiti. Other projects that we have include gardens, community mosaic projects, arts projects, museum projects, creative writing. And we're looking, therefore, to see where our Roman heritage can have a transformational economic and societal benefit. Now, I've mentioned the distant stones, and this was a very successful reconstruction that the local community in Bowness uh, put in place uh, in 2012. And it's still an incredibly spectacular feature in the landscape. And obviously, and you will have heard from Louisa Campbell earlier today, that we know that the Roman world was a lot more colourful than we often visualise and reconstruct it today. And you've heard from Louisa about the exciting work she's doing, which is enabling us to consider about the colours that we want to put on reconstructions of the distant stones on the Antonine Wall. And Louise has probably talked about the replica distance stones that are going in, the four new reconstructions that have been created, some by students from Glasgow College, plus a totally new one that's been created in a Roman style, but with Iron Age imagery to celebrate the project. In Scotland, another interesting feature we have on the Antonine Wall is the pottery styles and pottery that showed that some soldiers cooked their food in a style more popular in northwestern Africa than in northwestern Europe. And that's probably also been discussed by David Brees today. The late Dr Vivian Swan identified a number of different pottery types, including a form of casserole dish that may have been a precursor to the modern tagine and brazier style cooking. Now, whether these were soldiers from North Africa or troops who learned a different cooking style after perhaps serving in North Africa, we do not know, particularly as it's now thought that the pottery came from a workshop in Gaul in modern day France. 
But a recent military diploma does show that the first cohort of Baitasians from the modern day Netherlands served in the Mauritanian war. And we know that they were also stationed on the Antonine Wall, as shown here on this altar to Jupiter found at Old Kilpatrick. So we know we have an African connection. And in addition, Quintus Lollius Urbicus, the governor of Britain who built the Antonine Wall, was from Numidia in modern day Algeria. As archaeologists, we can use the vast array of analytical tools and dissemination techniques now available to us to tell a story of a more diverse past. We know that the Roman Empire occupied a vast geographic space encompassing people with different skin, eye and hair colour, and that people travelled vast distances across the empire, soldiers, families, traders and merchants. Obviously, I've just mentioned Lollius Urbicus and the possible presence of Africans along with known regiments from Syria and other places far away from Scotland. This particular BBC cartoon, which caused quite a bit of controversy a few years ago, where well, Mary Beard has commented that she thinks the soldier was based on Lollius Urbicus. Not sure whether that's true or not, but it is interesting. And again, it's bringing out the diversity of the empire. We also later have the Emperor Septimius Severus from Leptis Magna in modern day Libya, who is also referred to as Rome's African emperor, who campaigned in Scotland and died in York. So we have all this wonderful evidence that you've heard from various people today and you will do today and tomorrow. And a number of my colleagues are bringing together a lot of this evidence and thinking about the interpretation that they place on it to bring together sites, artifacts and reconstructions to help bring the past to life, particularly for the communities that live in these areas today. We also collaborate across borders and countries, sharing knowledge, skills and expertise with colleagues from frontiers around the Roman Empire. As archaeologists, we're getting better at telling stories and collaborating to tell more stories of people like Salmanes, the trader, and Vivia Picata, the wife of a centurion, and these help to enrich the picture that we can present of life in the past. We need to think about the stories that we tell and how inclusive we're being. October is Black History Month. Roman archaeology offers us a fantastic opportunity to use our past in the present. Roman frontiers are long monuments which stretch for many miles through numerous different landscapes which have different modern day land use and communities. And yet they're all connected now through our aspirations for world heritage site status and our shared research and management objectives. And in the past, through the diversity of the Roman Empire, where soldiers and people from one end of the empire could find themselves stationed or trading at the other end of the empire, connected and sharing practices and experiences. Now, 2020 has obviously been a very disruptive year for us all, and I'm sure we've all taken pause to reflect on what we feel is important to us. Health, well-being and family and community all feature. Now, all of these are important to archaeology in the ways in which we understand and interpret the past. Roman frontiers may have divided communities in the past, but through the lens of time, they provide us with an opportunity to connect across different communities, across different ethnic divides and across countries and continents. And many of these artifacts and objects and sites are helping us to bring people together and help them to celebrate diversity and inclusiveness in the past and in the present. And with all of these things, all of this work is very much a team effort. And what I've been talking to you about today is, is a lot of it is the work of other people. So I want to thank everybody um, who's been working on the various projects and thank you for listening. Um, I'm sorry I'm not there in person to take any questions or to join in the discussion. And I look forward to catching up with all the presentations later, but it's actually our half term at the moment. And with any luck, whilst you're watching this, I'll be um, having a lot of fun on a ride in Legoland. Thank you for listening.